Smithash, you can go live now. Yes, sir. Now I can start. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. A very good evening to one and all present here. Today, we are here to celebrate Despagia Awareness Month. This event is a joint collaborative effort of Indian Academy of Neurology, Indian Federation of Neuro Rehabilitation, Indian Speech and Hearing Association Special Interest Group of Despagia, Society for Feeding and Swallowing Disorder. This event is a multidisciplinary panel discussion on dysphagia in stroke and traumatic brain injury. Now I call upon Indian Academy of Neurology's president, Dr. Nirmal Surya. Digital team, can I have Sir's CV, please? Sir is also president of Indian Federation of Neuro Rehabilitation. He is currently actively participating in various capacities in several professional associations like World Federation of Neuro Rehabilitation, American Academy of Neurology, Asian Ocean Society for Neuro Rehabilitation. Sir has received Patient Advocate Award. He has also received Certificate of Appreciation by WHO for his dialogue on epilepsy care model for a resort constraints setting. Sir has always been supportive and in always been a backbone in conducting IAN and IFNR neuro rehab activities. Sir, may I request you to say your opening remarks? I think he has gone for I the WHO. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So um, I also uh, thank his support. And along with that, I thank IAN Secretary Dr. Minakshi Sundaram. Can I have his slides, please? Yes. I thank him for his support. And he is right now unable to join us because of his professional commitments. His best wishes are with us for this program. Again, I thank IAN President Dr. Nirmal Surya and IAN Secretary Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram for giving us this opportunity and also to collaborate along with supporting organization. This session is coordinated uh, with the help of Dr. Professor Manmohan Mandiratha. Can I have his slides, please? Yes. Sir is Chair of IAN Neuro Rehab Subsection. Can I have Dr. Abhishek's slide, please? The other coordinator is Dr. Abhishek Srivastam. He is convener of IAN Neuro Rehab subsection and also director of Indian Federation of Neuro Rehabilitation. Next slide, please. Mr. Prasanna, he is a coordinator of Isha SIG Dysphagia and secretary of Society for Feeding and Swallowing Disorder India. May I have the CV of discussant, please? That's me. I am Dr. Preeti Shetty. I'm an associate professor at Nasima Institute of Speech and Hearing and consultant speech and swallow specialist at Apollo Hospital, Bengaluru. Now, uh, I would like to introduce the moderator that is Dr. Nirmal Surya. Uh, in his absence, I request Dr. Abhishek Srivastav uh, to take over as moderator until Sir joins us. Sir, now I request you to introduce the chairperson. Yeah. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Preeti. Uh, welcome you all from behalf of uh, IAN Neuro Rehab Subsection, Infectation Neuro Rehab, Aphasia Group. I think it's one of the biggest webinars you are having with a multidisciplinary team focusing on all different components of dysphagia. And the aim is to learn with all of you together and spread the knowledge so we can help each other as well as our patients and manage them in a more effective way. We are today privileged to have with us uh, Dr. M.V. Padma Srivastava, who just not in any introduction. She is the Professor Head Department of Neurology, Chief of the Center at AMC New Delhi. She is a uh, study of interest in stroke, multiple sclerosis, very active researcher, uh, multiple publications, 300 and I don't know how many chapters and books she has. She's a Padam Shri by Government of India in 2016. She's on board national surveillance program past president of Indian Stroke Association. And I recently actually met her in an online program a few months back. They are part of a project to develop even up in robotics, low cost models in another country. Dr. Padma, thank you very much for joining today's webinar with us. 
I'll require Dr. Padma to please introduce the different speakers, and then we'll take it forward. Thank you so much, and it's it's a great honor to be here. And as you rightly said, that this uh, seems to be a huge transdisciplinary, um, you know, kind of um, um, I would say coming together of such disciplines, which is rare, and getting spearheaded by none other than Dr. Nirmal Surya and Abhishek. I can't put this past you both. You're just the kind of uh, couple who can do this. I mean, you could do this. And then really congratulations so much for that. And uh, uh, I will quickly introduce the, uh, the panelists that we have. Some of you I know personally, I know Biplav out there, he looks young. He is young, but I must say that he's one of the, uh, the greatest guns we have in uh, our the, the stroke uh, management uh, screen that we have in our country. And uh, he's fast going to be one of the iconic figures you would see. And I would say young because his age is younger to me. All right. So they, they, uh, and then we have, of course, uh, Abhishek out there, who is the, the vertical on which this project, this whole program is being built. And he is also, uh, uh, in, in, at least in, in the field that which is closest to me, of uh, the restoring the function once uh, there is an injury, he's really one of the verticals I would I would actually like to work with. And then can I have the, the others please? So we have uh, Dr. Nupur there. Can I have the Preeti? Please keep putting up the slides because I don't want to miss out the, you know, their, their uh, affiliations as well as their awards and other things. Is, is, uh, is Dr. Nupur's thing there? This is Dr. Mansi Jakta, I believe. Okay, doesn't matter. Mansi? Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, again, the speech and language with all the SLP and SLTs is something which, which is um, so much required and we have such a dearth. And here I, I keep seeing these, uh, not just people who have done it, but actually being leaders in that. So I'm, I'm so, so happy to have all these people out here, because as a stroke person, I know the biggest cause of death is, is an aspiration. And even beyond aspiration, we know what's going to happen in such individuals. We know the, the, you know, the risk factors which lead to it and also the spin-offs of nutrition and all those long-term issues. But then, you know, when you're coming to uh, the actual uh, brass tacks of, of managing this, we have really have very few the working hands which expertise so so happy to have you here so a lot of achievements out there and she's currently the president of SFSD India and she's from Ruby Hall uh, Cancer Center welcome Mansi here the Thank next you. one please we have here where is I can't see the 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 name Dr. Nopur yeah. Nopur yeah so she's consultant laryngologist and uh, I I guess you, you you're in Bombay Hospital Dr. Nopur so it is, it is, and then I That's was looking right, at yeah. the areas of interest, neurolaryngology. I mean, how many of us uh, have actually even heard of it? Surely we must have you once at AIMS. I'm going to keep a tab on you and, 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 and right. invite That's you here. Right. So phonomicrosurgery, and, and I guess you are a professional voice, uh, you know, office procedures, dysphagia, amazing. And she's also the past president of Associations of Phonosurgeons of India. Uh, it's a great honor to have you on board, ma'am. Next. Uh, this is who? Dr. Srimati. Yes, Dr. Srimati, uh, the clinical dietitian, Trustwell Hospitals, and expert in health and wellness nutrition. You are another person I think I need to invite you here because this is such a, you know, one aspect which is happily swept under the carpet and not looked at is, is you know, what people eat. And it is such an integral point to, to have a, a better outcome. In fact, having an out, optimal outcome. So happy to have you here. 22 years of experience in clinical dietetics, which is, which is uh, awesome. Welcome on board. Next. Dorcas Gandhi. Dorcas. I know Dorcas. You know, this girl, I mean, she's a little girl. And she's all over the place, and she's she's there, up there, and whether it is a, it is in in terms of uh, international, 
uh, the cardiovascular and cerebrovascular uh, aspects, uh, you, you can see that she is with the ESO, she's with the World Stroke Congress, the World Heart Federation. And uh, coming from CMC Ludhiana, as such, CMC Ludhiana has produced a lot of iconic figures. But this young girl, uh, currently the Associate Professor of College of Physiotherapy and the Tele Rehab Consultant, um, and you know, say that the Lancet Citizens Commission Research, well, I don't know how many, how many feathers you have in your hat already, Dockers. Uh, welcome. Next. This is, this is who? Mani Dr. Gandhi. Mani Gandhan. Okay, uh, is, he, is he joining from uh, India or outside? Actually, he's, he's, right he's now he's, in, he's traveling to Chennai, so he will join us oh, from Chennai. Okay, 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 okay. So he is an occupational therapist and uh, there is, I, I keep uh, seeing his projects and some of the DST and other, uh, you know, I'm a member of those task forces. So, but lovely projects. And then he is, uh, um, I think, again, uh, from an iconic college, CMC Valor. And uh, I think he is based in Ireland, isn't it? And currently yes, in India, I guess. So, yes. welcome on board. Yes. Yeah. So, that is it. So, big spectrum out there. So, uh, Abhishek, are you going to start shooting the questions? Yes, yes. Preeti will yeah, start. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. So we are glad to have you, have you with us, ma'am. Uh, so we can begin the panel discussion. Can I have the slides, please? And welcome to all the panelists here. Digital team, can we have the slides? So my first question is to Dr. Bipla. Can you please tell us what is the incidence and prevalence of dysphagia and stroke and traumatic brain injury? Yeah, so good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, ma'am, for such a <laughs> wonderful, kind introductions. And uh, thank the uh, whole team, uh, especially Nimal Sar and uh, Dr. Abhishek and all. And it's a really uh, pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, platform. Okay, so dysphagia, as, as Mem was also telling, you know, patients coming with stroke and uh, traumatic brain injury, and uh, the people, uh, you know, demise, the die is because of uh, complication of dysphagia in terms of like they might be having either respiration pneumonia, one of the cause of uh, uh, sepsis, ARDS sort of picture, and uh, other things mutations which is happening or dehydrations which give rise to some kidney problem and other things. So dysphagia is such a such a common uh, uh, kind of uh, things, not so much uh, even addressed, uh, I would say. And uh, as you asked, so what is the I mean, prevalence and incidence? So uh, there are so much of variable data out there. If you look into the uh, published data from Indian subcontinent or worldwide. Uh, but from practical perspective, whenever we talk about a stroke, so in, in my hospital, in my uh, unit, in my ward, so I would say more than 50% patients with stroke, persons who are having a stroke, is having dysphagia, difficulty in swelling problems. And out of these, I would say around 30 or 40% of patients requiring nasogastric tube in some times so during their early treatment. Right, so this is the this is the figure what is there, and if you look into the data also, uh, the stroke says that like around um, thirty to fifty percent patients are uh, having uh, symptoms of dysphagia, but it will depend upon which part of the brain is affected because of stroke, right? So because um, we usually think that somebody who present with dysphagia is because of um, involvement of our uh, post, I mean back, so that is called the brain stem. If the brain stem is involved. So the chances of dysphagia is high. It is right, of course, but at the same time, when the cerebrum is involved, especially the cortical part is involved, there is high likely chances that the person might be having dysphagia as well. So this is in short uh, to say about like stroke uh, patients having dysphagia problem and dysphagia is very, very commonly seen. And although if it's a mild dysphagia, we need to look for that because the person might be having um, aspiration pneumonia also because of dysphagia. 
coming to the point of uh, traumatic brain injury tbi so uh, this is happening in, in current scenario so frequently uh, uh, young guys coming with tbi or maybe anybody so having uh, dysphagia and it it again what is the severity of traumatic brain injury if you talk about severe brain uh, severe uh, tbi or something like where the person is unconscious for more than 6 hours or something like that or if you are talking about somebody is having amnesia for a long time so this person might be having dysphagia you know nearly more than 90% i would say 90 95% or even 100% person patients might be having uh, dysphagia so the data which is available all over the world is uh, quite variable like you know based on the uh, nature severity of uh, a traumatic brain injury so some of the data says like uh, the persons even after 3 months after 3 months of traumatic brain injury the persons might be more than 50% of patients might be having dysphagia okay so dysphagia is always there we need to look for somebody sometimes patient complain sometimes we as a physician or we as a treating uh, you know team we need to look for it to uh, to have a proper uh, you know walk up so that we, this patients can be given proper treatment and and even even in general population because it's it's a forum discussions i mean i would say that in in population also it's a, such a common even there is a slogan where we say that one in six can have a you know a dysphagia sometimes is having dysphagia it's like a stroke slogan which is there earlier in a um, few years back like we used to during our residency time we used to say like one in six might be having a stroke so similarly one in six is having a, a dysphagia chance of dysphagia and uh, so so from this one you can you can make out that how much how common the symptoms is how common the problem is in in our in our society in our population and all 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 this which is not necessarily because of you know stroke or tbi there are so many other causes there are so many other treatable causes there are so many other mild causes are there you know simple gastritis problem can be can have a presentations of dysphagia somebody is having uh, some other uh, dysfunction in the form of uh, like infections can give rise to dysphagia also so this is in short just to give you the glimpse of what what are the you know magnitudes of uh, disease uh, i mean what the magnitude of dysphagia which is there in patients who are in stroke or in tbi over to you thank you yeah. thank you dr beplab for bringing out the fact that there are about 50% of them who are having dysphagia that's a big number the next question please can i have this slide so this is to dr abhishek sir can you please throw some light on what are the pathophysiological difference leading to dysphagia and stroke and traumatic brain injury that's a good question preeti the basic difference primarily is a <clears throat> stroke cause a focal deficit so whichever part of brain is involved because of stroke that will cause dysphagia one versus in traumatic brain injury uh, multiple things happen Uh, injury can be because of a focal hematoma specific part of the brain or there is component of axonal injury from the also was a query hypoxic injury or not with that so people in tbi can have a neuromuscular problem along with sensory deficits because of multiple brain injuries being involved so one big difference second difference is that they can have associated fractures in the facial region which can also cause pain and difficulty in swallowing one reason affect the oral phase a uh, third you can say people also have uh, cognitive and communicative problems in tbi very common because frontal lobe involved they have cognitive issues and that leads to learning difficulty which can further complicate that with dysphagia fourth people have behavioral problems with tbi which affect their participation versus as compared to stroke and fifth very important difference is that tbi mostly happens in younger people a stroke happening in a people with older age with multiple comorbidities so be, so tbi this phase is much more difficult to treat it has multi more causative problems than primarily stroke but one difference is there in stroke if you have a anterior strokes or a posterior strokes things are different so if you have posterior stroke pca territory involvement which primarily affect the brain stem as people were saying there you can have local nerves being involved and that can cause much more severe form of dysphagia in the pca strokes in the anterior circulation strokes so dysphagia more common in tbi than stroke because of multiple parts of brain being involved 
second n strokes posterior strokes difficulty than anterior part of the strokes thank you prithvi so that that is nicely summed up uh, uh, dr abhishek that is true and uh, in stroke per se that as you rightly said it also is um depending upon the severity as well as the site of affection and the anterior posterior versus others and of course um it's also true that we have other multiple factors which you rightly said depends upon the age the other comorbid situations uh, which may be paripasu even in a stroke patient the only thing which may favor a tbi is that the ages are varied and you can have more of these uh, injuries in younger people not necessarily but a young person with a traumatic brain injury versus a 75 year old with a brain stem stroke even if it is a lateral medullary syndrome which seems a little something would have in terms of an outcome if uh, somebody is not really looking at it maybe very so the pathophysiology as you absolutely wonderfully put it that is the difference but in a given patient maybe other factors will also be correlated for your comprehensive rehab program in that individual thank you so much that's really nicely spelled out preeti we can go to the next question yes ma'am so that was so important to know the difference between anterior and posterior stroke there so my next question is to speech language pathologist dr mansi can you please tell us what's the burden of dysphagia in india uh good evening everybody and this is a wonderful question which actually brings us to the crux of matter uh as uh, uh, the neurologist very rightly put that uh, the incidence and prevalence of dysphagia is so high uh, we do see a lot of skewed uh, statistics when we talk about the professional to patient ratio so there are very few hands that can uh, proceed with uh, effective treatment of these patients so there is a lot of burden on the professionals and also to um, you know specify that these patients go through a lot of problems in their personal lives or a medical hassles however it also impacts their and their family's quality of life which is again a, a point which is very very important to be considered so a burden also lies on the individual who suffers from dysphagia and also on the family and the carers who are taking care of the person with dysphagia so i think um, the burden in india is extremely high and we definitely need more hands and more uh, effective uh, approach towards management of individuals with dysphagia in india thank you very much i uh, absolutely i think and mansi maybe you can be a leader in this and try to get actual statistics now sure, that you have a group which is connected and it could be spearheaded by dr abhishek and have at least maybe a questionnaire kind of an issue where you know if even if you send out about 100 of them maybe 10 of them will actually respond because getting this huge country into uh, or you know at least get some kind of, it, the, the thing that i'm sure abhishek you also agree with me that the thing that we lack is that like you you take uh, spain and you take the zones of you can say catalina then the entire stroke system from uh, you know the pre to the uh, that we have is all connected so either in a digital platform and it becomes mandatory it's actually inbuilt it becomes a citizens responsibility that you get in and i'm not saying that we don't have that civic sense but maybe our infrastructure the timelines as well as people in your busy practice you can't go online and keep feeding in data but maybe 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 you can make an effort mansi and actually get the stats out there as to then you have the burden in terms of having an incidence and prevalence and you know at least a point uh, saying that yes in my this thing this is a percentage and i'm sure yeah. you yeah, abhishek maybe that's a take home that you know after this through iin and ifnr you can have this as at least get those things even with these people who are connected with you yeah. and uh, do that thank you man we we'll get thank some data you. we'll get some data yeah definitely thank you yes Def- definitely so quality of life is something that we all strive for food is considered as a sign of joy i think everybody sh- should enjoy and there should be a way forward so our next question is 
to Dr. Biplav uh, first, and then to Dr. Abhishek, then to Dr. Nupur, and then to Dr. Dorcas. So every stroke or TBI patient should undergo a screening for dysphagia. What's your opinion and experience on this? Yeah, absolutely. So that uh, you've already given uh, the answer, actually. Uh, so definitely. So uh, treating dysphagia is is a uh, team effort. Okay. So it's not like only the physicians or neurologist or clinician. Uh, they they have to take the decision of everything. So this is always a team. So say for example, we talk about um, stroke. So we do have uh, the stroke comprehensive team where SLP. And we, we, we go for a combined round and then see the patients, assess the patients and wherever where the patient is required. So this is being assessed by uh, SLP and uh, uh, other team members, so not only the neurologist only, okay? So this is a screening for uh, dysphagia, even in milder stroke also, patients who are having, we need to look for it because uh, if we ignore in these patients, as I said, so there will be chances of um, aspirations and there will be difficult, you know, sometimes aspirations pausing and which can give rise to aspiration pneumonia and uh, so on. So always it is a team effort from my group. It's always team effort. Yeah. Dr. Abhishek, you have your yeah. points? Yeah, there are guidelines available from American Academy, Indian Academy, European Academy, that all patients with stroke who needs rehab, at least have impairments in two out of six affection, should be managed in a comprehensive unit, a comprehensive stroke unit or a comprehensive rehab unit. And all these patients has to be seen by the multisphere team in the first 48 hours. So take home messages, all of us, wherever we are working, we should be able to formulate a team and that team should see that any patient with stroke or TBI in the first 48 hours. If we can do that, we can prevent many secondary complications to happen. Definitely, sir. Dr. Nupur, your viewpoint? Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for the invitation, the introduction, and the question. I do think it's very important to have a clinical bedside evaluation, as mentioned by Dr. Abhishek and others. Uh, what we do like to do is uh, have a joint bedside evaluation as far as possible of the speech language pathologist and me. Uh, where we do a simple evaluation of laryngeal elevation, uh, you know, the awake uh, nature of the patient and what is the cough like, what is the voice like. Uh, the issue basically is the silent aspiration where it may seem sometimes that everything is okay, but it's not okay. So um, if, uh, you know, it is not an impossible situation, I would always encourage that we just put in a flexible laryngoscope bedside and just check at least for the silent aspiration that that's not happening. So I think that as a bare minimum should be encouraged. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Dr. Dirkus, your viewpoints. Hi, uh, thank you so much. So um, like Dr. Srivastava already mentioned, um, the need is really high and most of the guidelines do mention and from what we follow here in our center in the first 72 hours uh, some sort of screening at least the baseline screening needs to be done for dysphagia swallowing disorders and every delay i've read in a paper by bray bd at all i think 2017 it says that every delay um, in four or five hours increases the chances of sap by one percent as a physiotherapist, we are, our role is uh, not, I, I wouldn't say minor here, but then with respect to, um, uh, you know, strength and uh, contraction capabilities of the muscles, not just of the shoulder girdle, of the neck, um, of the extensors of the back, of the trunk on the affected side, if it's in the case of stroke. All of them are recorded uh, right in the first, after the hyperacute phase for us to understand how the patient can be you know, treated uh, in addition to uh, swallowing uh, exercises. So, Preeti, if I could come in here. Yes, ma'am. Um, um, you know, actually, when you, when you are uh, testing out for dysphagia, uh, the FEST protocol is actually inbuilt into our acute stroke program, into all the stroke units. And while I echo all the, uh, uh, you know, the aspects that the, the panelists had said, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of an example of what could be done as an optimal care and what is actually practically being done even in uh, the comprehensive stroke centers. So we've, uh, we have a program 
with uh, the UCLAN, that is the University of Lancashire, where it's essentially a training program for stroke nursing. Because as mm -hmm. you understand, uh, the nurses play an integrally, uh, it's a huge and mammoth-sized vertical of its own. And they're, they're, they're part of the, the team that Bipla and Abhishek were all mentioning that stroke is always managed by a team. It's not by an individual and a stroke nurse is integral to that. And the first protocol, whether it is performed by the stroke nurse or by a resident, includes this aspect of whether, you know, what form the feeding, when and how it should be initiated. And in that, the, the actual viscosity of the food, once you start, is also, you know, uh, there, there are definitive parameters and it is objectivized. It's almost like a MCQ. You know, it, it is not like, okay, semi-solid, so let's have upma, let's have some thicker, smooth. So those parameters are inbuilt as exact, and the viscosity is actually measured. The quantity and how you, how you give the first protocols, all of us know the swallowing assessment before you initiate. And which is part of that. And then the last part of it, they said that let's have a video laryngoscopy, what Dr. Nupur was talking about. And uh, this is not possible even in a lot of conferences, stroke centers, whether it was in terms of, you know, the stroke care in Ames or uh, down south in Sri Chitra or uh, even in CMC. Whereas, you know, because we were all involved in this program, because you needed that the, the ENT to come in and also specific, you know, place and, and, and time slot for the laryngoscopy to be done. And then, so I think these are practical aspects. And, and so what Dr. Nupur is saying is extremely, extremely important because to objectivize and get the best form of uh, protocols in place, the ultimate outcome is that we don't want aspiration to happen and we want optimal nutrition and we want to rehab and we want them to get back on not just their feet, but also they want to feed on their own. So that part of it, I think there is a thing. We all need to work towards uh, that part. And I totally agree with you that there are a lot of, we have gaps in our stroke chain of survival and this is one big chunk which needs to be fulfilled. Professor Nirmal has his hand out. You can have the, the last, the last word is Dr. Nirmal. So you're, you're muted. muted. Yeah. Can the digital team unmute, sir? Yeah. No, no, I, I, I'm also on the other webinar, so that's the okay. reason I have to first unmute that uh, voice, otherwise you won't be able to hear my voice. So I'm sorry, I, I was on the international WFNR Silver Jubilee webinar on, uh, on the opportunity career chances for young clinician and scientists in neurorehabilitation. Unfortunately, both class this uh, Preeti in the last moment has uh, put 29th as a speech and swelling. I'm glad that it has uh, gone through well and there are so many people around here. So uh, very interesting. I heard about uh, comments from uh, all of you. And I just want to, uh, Nupur is already here and she has been our, uh, 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 she has the team of uh, swallowing assessment with uh, Jenna working with her, giving the, uh, speech and swallowing therapy for all of our patients of the stroke in, in Bombay Hospital so we, for the last many years. So the last five years, uh, uh, my resident who has uh, been uh, DM doing the DM, I just gave them a simple protocol to assess the swallowing of all the patients of acute stroke on the day one when they are admitted, if it is possible in the ICU. And then as soon as they get out of the ICU, they reassess them for the swallowing assessment. And then where they are getting discharged, the day they are getting discharged, they reassess them. So we have been categorically over 150 patients of acute stroke, both anterior as well as posterior stroke, following day one up, out of ICU and uh, hospital. And what is interesting is, uh, and the, what we are following is very simple. I being in the neuro rehab, started neuro rehab department at Nair, and Nair Hospital has worked out on the uh, swallowing uh, scale. So 
we follow the Nair Hospital following a scale, very simple bedside. And I tell you that uh, the incidence of swallowing disturbance in acute stroke is 32%. So 32% patient with acute stroke have some sort of swallowing disturbance on admission in the ICU. Only 9% patient had continued to have it once they are transferred out of the ICU. And these are the patient who has been examined by uh, Dr. Nupur, she went through the fees, and then they, they continue to have the therapy. But by the time they were discharged from the home, it's only 3% patient who had swallowing disturbance. And these are the patient who has predominantly either a large stroke or the posterior fossa stroke. So what I want to say is that unless you look for it, you are not going to get it. And therefore, all the neurologists and everybody who is been treating the stroke should look for the swallowing disturbance in every elderly gentleman who has been admitted. That's my message to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's it. I said you are the final word. Uh, Preeti, I think yes. Preeti, I think the next question is very related. You can say yes. 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 And you can go straight to requirement of nutrition. Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. So the next question is to Dr. Srimati. Ma'am, how do you manage the requirement of nutrition in person with dysphagia in acute care and long-term care? Privileged to be here. Good evening, all. And I'm definitely going to contact many of you to address the dietitian fraternity. So thank you so much for uh, inviting me here, Preeti. So for dysphagia has always been a very... Uh, close to my heart thing because I work in a neuro center as well as in a GI where different things, more of neuro and uh, traumatic brain injury and stroke center. So first we need to know that dysphagia should not be attributed to normal aging. So when it is coming to acute things, so the Ministry of Health has told that not only we are going to be a youth country in 100 million in 2013 to 198 million in 2030. So many people think that at home when they try to cough, then they are doing, they take it lightly saying that, okay, he's just, it's a normal part of aging and all that. So we need to create awareness. Dysphagia should not be part of normal aging because there is a lot of sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass in our country. And uh, there is a lot of uh, protein deficiency in our Indian diets also. So eating smaller frequent meals in an acute setting First of all, trying to find out what type of foods produce these symptoms in an acute dysphagia. So is it like, uh, it can be even a chronic heartburn where people tell that, okay, I have something look stuck in my throat and it would be like a chronic heartburn or a stricture or a stroke, different things. So we need to find out from a clinical dietitian point of view, I've always worked with the SLP very closely and I know that the interdisciplinary team for dysphagia is very, very important. So what types of foods produce these symptoms and accordingly try to modify, even if it is difficulty swallowing liquids, what types? So India is a very diverse country where food is completely different, even inside a state. For example, in Karnataka, North Karnataka will not eat just like the same thing as an urban where it is. So even in any state for that matter, there are staple foods, the cereals are completely different. Food is something very personal. So we need to make sure that they get the right food, which they are comfortable with, uh, change the consistency in the right way, uh, educate the attenders very clearly. And uh, then, so this is how we do eat more slowly depends upon the type of food they are having difficulty swallowing with, trying foods of different textures. And this, it would be for the acute care. For the long-term care, we need to see that the nutrition loading, whatever the small quantity which they are having, that has to be loaded with. So the nutrient dense is what we are trying to make sure that even if they eat that six to eight spoons, it needs to be made sure that it is nutritionally loaded, nutrition loading or nutrient dense foods. Thank you. So that's, that's been nicely and succinctly, uh, you know, summarized. 
and uh, you know the 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 earlier we realize that the integral importance of this aspect in the stroke and as well as tbi care the better off we are with it it's high time that country woke up to this so uh, priti want to go on yes, to the next one yes ma'am so we have a next question to abhishek sir uh, what do you think uh, what are the medical and surgical management for dysphagia as a treatment or prevention of complications is with the question showing is different this, this seventh is, uh, question this is, this, this is already done then yeah, yeah. So we need to go to the seventh question seven number question. seven yeah So medically, uh, people who have dysphagia, uh, if you're treating a person, suppose who has a tracheostomy, has a massive uh, PCA stroke and has a tracheostomy with a feeding tube, be it a nasogastrostomy or a or a Ryle's tube or a PEG tube, two three things will interfere with solo therapy primarily. One is if they're producing more saliva, so there are medications and injection to reduce the amount of saliva people are producing. Second is people have secretions, and they have to follow that saliva well, or they are producing more secretion in their lung. So one important job is to make the secretion more amenable to be removed out from the airway. So there are very thick secretions. You have to liquefy it. There are nebulizers available for that. Second, if there are very thin mucoid secretion, people keep on pouring. Again, you have to have medication to make them more thicker, so they are easier to take it out. So there are different types of nebulizers available for that. Third is, uh, if people have upper respiratory or lower respiratory infections, you have to give nebulization which contains antibiotics. We commonly use topramycin nibs for that. So you use nebulization for changing the consistency of secretions or to prevent infections. Third component is uh, people who have lower respiratory or long, long with that, they can have bronchospasms. So again, you need medication as well as nebulizations. To really bronchospasm, so they can clear the secretion more better. So we use medication to reduce saliva, to change consistency of the secretions, help with the airway clearance. And sometimes people, uh, especially in PCA strokes, uh, they have a problem of upper respiratory, upper esophageal sphincter, which remains tight. So there's a follow reflex when food goes on the back of the tongue. There's a follow reflex. The upper sphincter of the esophagus it, it opens. and the bolus goes to the esophagus in a pca stroke this coordination is lost these patients have persistent ues spasm then you have to do a fees and do a little fluoroscopy document it these guys actually just cannot follow anything they keep on spitting whole day so you have to do a botulinum toxin injection to the cricopharyngeal muscle we do it earlier with the endoscopy now do with the ultrasound simply bedside just take a normal ultrasound see the us center And just give bottom tox injection there that works wonders is figures filter opens up and then saliva can go into the food pipe so medications are required for these four primary things in dysphagia management thank you sir dr nupur your view point Uh, yeah thanks i think dr shrivastav has uh, very efficiently covered the medical management uh, situation and definitely when i see a patient who's literally drowning in his or her uh, secretions and saliva glycopyrrolate is something you know if the physician gives an okay we do encourage uh, such a patient if they don't have a tracheostomy that's definitely again something we would encourage um yes when we have patients who've got a vocal fold paralysis or a paresis and there's a large phonetic gap because of that um then we can do simple office procedures like an injection laryngoplasty where we take simply a material like hyaluronic acid and you know we just inject it either percutaneously or transorally typically i do the percutaneous one it's a simple office procedure which even moribund patients typically can withstand and it helps because it gets rid of the phonetic gap completely uh, the material lasts for about 6 uh, months of course we have permanent uh, surgery is like thyroplasty but we always start with something temporary like a, a office procedure injection laryngoplasty 
And then again, as Dr. Shavasta mentioned, when you have a severe cryptopharyngeal spasm and the saliva just can't go in, you can document it with the video fluoroscopy. But we typically, are, we, we typically do the botulinum toxin injections, pretty high doses of about 30 to 50 mouse units on either side. And we are using the EMG control, but of course one can use uh, a USG control. And uh, these patients do improve. And surprisingly, even though the uh, Botox effect is supposed to wear off in six months time. Typically, the cricophyngeal spasm usually does not recur. So that's something um, promising. But if it does recur, then when you can take up the patient and do an endoscopic cricophyngeal myotomy or an open cricophyngeal myotomy. Uh, these are some of the uh, surgical, there are some other surgical procedures. I don't know whether you want me to discuss those as uh, also. So uh, can I ask you a question, Anupur? So uh, yes. for both Abhishek and Anupur, uh, say in case we do uh, put in a right tube, a feeding tube, or at, a, at some point you get a peg instituted because there is, you know, there are situations not just on TBI. I mean, they, they would just go on to a cognitive impairment, which is one of the disabilities which has taken off. And there are situations where you need to go on. Does do these modes actually prevent aspiration? No. So that, that, that's, you know, one is you're taking care of the nutrition part and also giving medications and, you know, all those other things. So it's a portal where you're ensuring that there is, there is a nutritional, you know, optimization as well as intake of medication. But do these procedures actually prevent aspiration or is there something else that one needs to do even when a feeding tube or a peg is in place? Will you want to comment on that? Both of you. Sorry, Preeti, I have, I have sort of... No problem. I like your no question uh, very much, actually, because uh, putting a feeding tube or doing a peg is in no way going to uh, take care of whatever aspiration is happening. This is, as you mentioned, just for the nutrition of the patient. So therefore, if you see a patient drowning in the old saliva, you have to have a tracheostomy there with a cuff tube uh, to prevent that. And if you have a patient you're trying to rehabilitate, then you do the other procedures, whether it be, you know, uh, electrical stimulation to encourage a laryngeal elevation so that the upper sphincter opens up or be it Botox to open up the sphincter or be it like I said hyaluronic acid to take care of the phonetry gap uh, but the what you're doing is different the the feeding tube the rails tube is in no way going to prevent the aspiration from taking place thank you just to add what Dr. Nupur is saying there's something called as RT induced micro aspiration many people uh, actually the the saliva and the secretion they trickle down along the rails tube and the reflex is not good it just comes and trickle to the laryngeal inlet, cause silent aspiration. Very common reason, especially in PCS strokes. So if you are rehabilitating a person with a PCS strokes, all is better to do a PEG versus RT because they have you're very difficult to learn to swallow with tube in your mouth or the throat. So every time you are swallowing your saliva, the RT you feel you're getting the feeling of sensation choking in the throat. So if you have PCS strokes, better to do a PEG than RT. One second. Again, as Dr. Nupur was saying, these tubes are for feeding, not to prevent aspiration. You have to have enough precautions being used by the nursing staff as well as trained caregivers to feed when they are feeding with these tubes. Very simple, keep them propped up at least half an hour after the feed. It's very one simple thing, can prevent many aspirations. People think if it's a peg, but people with peg do aspirate. So we should always tell them, you would do feeding with strict aspiration precaution. One simple thing, keep them 30 days propped up. One simple thing to manage. And second, as Indians, we want to load the food. We'll give it very fast and we give more volume than what is required told by the dietitian or the feeding team. So ensure the amount of volume you are giving in the tube should be as directed by the feeding team. Absolutely, I think so, Preeti. Because as it as it uh, again, I said I take a uh, take uh, take home message from this thing is that putting in tubes will not uh, ensure aspiration, and aspiration remains the bugbear for your for an outcome in, in terms yes. of both uh, disability and mortality. And the second is that simple positioning 
and the time of uh, you know keeping in that position which is so integrally inherently paramount importance in stroke management whether it is in the acute stroke or by feeding and of course the the other thing is also as again the nutritionists would come in here uh, on the quantum as well as the 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 amount which is given and also the intervals and i do believe and you know our dietitians would come and say that uh, there are sometimes there's retention so especially in a feeding tube you need to aspirate and and then give again and there are lots of these small things which people think are so simple that somebody else will do for them they won't do it and that's how they they sort of uh, get waylaid and nothing happens so that i think you can take that comment from dr srimati and then you can move yeah. on to the the next uh, thing yeah the volume is very important so as you said uh, dr abhishek was mentioning we try to uh, many attenders will try to overfeed the patient because they are very anxious that uh, they are losing weight or muscle mass and they look uh, very malnourished and uh, so the main thing is uh, the tube in mouth difficult to swallow i totally agree with you dr abhishek because we use a 16 french though the other thing there are 8 10 12 but 8 and 10 is available but uh, we use a really a big 16 french which is very difficult when we try to uh, do the uh, different textured diets and it is so difficult for them to swallow with the tube in place and the volume is very important so if it is like we have to make sure the water flush that is mentioned and the feed volume that is mentioned and the time duration that is very important and also the starting of the feeds from morning to night and not continuously give there are patients uh, attenders where because in the neuro patients the day and night is changed and he is awake they continuously feed even in the night and uh, many things happens usually you know that the day and night are changed and they said he is completely awake maybe he is hungry and they try to give him lot of uh, him or her lot of feet so i uh, always tell them that this is the volume you have to follow and of course the 30 to 45 degrees also and the flush volume and uh, the board size the french size if it is little bit less in our uh, practice that would also help a lot from 16 at least to a 12 that would help a lot thank you great so that is a that is a lot of good uh, you know take home stuff for all of us so preeti you can go on to the yes, next one yeah definitely we have an idea what should be the macro management and micro management we have to do so moving on to the next question it is how important is it, is it to manage tracheostomy appropriately aiding the spagia rehabilitation dr Bri uh, dr biplo can you briefly tell us what would it be okay so that's a, it's a interesting question actually probably i'd like to hear from other experts here uh, from a from a neurologist from a physician perspective for me you see um, the category of patients if you talk about i mean like stroke patients um, uh, like tracheostomy recurring these patients primarily uh, post cyclical stroke involving the brain stem and another so i i personally feel you know the, the patients when it is required so you need to go for a tracheostomy but at the same time although the tracheostomy with a cuff tube it prevents uh, some aspirations it is gum giving some you know edge over the others like uh, for prevention of uh, aspiration in such patients who are having dysphagia in associated with right but at the same time so probably because of the tracheostomy of this person uh, although that the person who is uh, who is already tracheostomized uh, we are not really you know doing clinical assessment in terms of like looking for dysphagia assessment and other things but down the line in a long term management they they might be required to have assessment for dysphagia because um, uh, so you are putting a tracheostomy tube here and then at the same time you are putting a tube for uh, uh, for dysphagia either in the form of like rt so in long term so the questions comes which was which was to be taken out first and how to assess for this one right uh, so as i said uh, because to me too it prevents for aspiration at the same time it gives dysphagia so really more uh, where is i would like to hear from all others actually from the doctor and all others yeah dr abhishek you have your point yeah i think uh, people think that uh, having tracheostomy is a curse so the first thing people ask in stroke units is 
when can a person walk and i can go home second when this gale ka cheese can be removed that's what is normally called as now tracheostomy is a very important thing to prevent aspiration but we should know two things people can speak with tracheostomy people can eat with tracheostomy both are possible and second thing you can remove tracheostomy in 70 to 80% of patients if you follow a decannulation protocol so it's very simple tracheostomy once you inflate a cuff forms a protective thing over the airways so the saliva doesn't trickle to the lungs so you have a inflated cuff with a cuff tracheostomy tube once you deflate the cuff you are what you are trying is to challenge your solo system to solo your saliva yourself you can take a colored liquid it's called as modified evan blue dietes give some colored liquid orally if it comes in your tt suction it means that you will person is silently as aspirant if it's not coming in suction which means you will solo saliva you can deflate the cup deflate it for 10 20 minutes three four times in a day teach your nurses and put up pessimia one way speaking well when you put a valve the person doesn't have a face able to speak also and if he can speak he will himself strengthen his solo muscles every time he is trying to speak you start solo therapy to strengthen these solo muscles gradually increase the duration of cup deflation and speaking well once you reach 24 hours of that it means a person is able to solo his saliva not food saliva 24 hours in a day so he is able to put it his airways if he can do that next step is can you cough out what is there in the lung so much suctions are required in a day so you promote do more spirometry do more chest physical therapy improve respiratory endurance when they can cough out enough suctions are very minimal you can downsize the tube you can block the tube block tube for 24 hours suctions are not required you can decannulate if you want a simple protocol you can decannulate most of the patients safely second type of patients are those who have long term tracheostomy requirement because of level of consciousness secondary problems those patients can speak with a tracheostomy the specimen is speaking well and you can do a fees or a video fluoroscopy document different three stages of follow can even start oral feeding with a tracheostomy so the decision is do you want to decannulate or you want to let them speak and eat with tracheostomy definitely sir no poor ma'am you are being points uh i do agree with uh, dr shrivastav's uh, you know what he told us about the protocol of uh, decannulation and that must be followed uh what we find actually is there's always a group of patients who is very tricky to decide is the tracheostomy a friend or a foe the problem is in that group of patients because um, they are not severely aspirating there is some micro aspiration so you have to decide now is the tracheostomy so useful to prevent the aspiration or is it actually now hampering the development of subglottic pressure the vocal folds from meeting one another laryngeal elevation from taking place properly because the tracheostomy is there itself so i think what uh, uh, what we learned also from susan langmore is not to be extremely terrified of micro aspiration and if a little bit of aspiration is happening i think we do especially in uh, let's say an in house setup when the patient is admitted we can be a little bold do the decannulation protocol observe the patients very closely see that they are not aspirating and developing uh, aspiration pneumonia but taking on the tracheostomy in this tricky group of patients where there is a little bit of micro aspiration uh can actually help because immediately you can have much better subglottic pressures developing and that whole tube weighing down the larynx and preventing laryngeal elevation goes away so it's that group of patients we always find difficult to make that decision that yes should we go ahead and it always helps if you have an understanding neurologist uh like dr nirmal surya you know who can understand what we are trying to achieve will an active physiotherapy help that So, so that, what you know the aftermath of at least if there are micro aspirations happening, but you really have an active positioning and physiotherapy, which would then what we worried about micro aspirations leading to an infective pathology and therefore again a spiraling downhill course that could be prevented by an active physiotherapy. Do you think it'll help? 
definitely it would help, but it would be, as we've mentioned, a teamwork where eventually the physiotherapist doesn't have to do the physiotherapy and the patient is able to, but yes, in the interim, it would very definitely help. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Mansi, uh, your viewpoint? Uh, so I think all the points have been covered by all the other experts. Uh, we know that tracheostomy brings along a lot of uh, uh, changes and a lot of alterations in the swallowing mechanism. Maybe the airflow differences, the mechanical differences, as sublotic pressure, which is required for swallowing, as uh, Nupur ma'am mentioned. So uh, dysphagia and decannulation, I always believe, is uh, interrelated to each other. Uh, the first step would be the patient needs to uh, manage his own secretions. That would be the point in time where I would start with the deflation of the cuff. I also uh, team up with my ENT and get a an fees test done. And I look for two things. Number one, are there any spontaneous swallows without any command? And secondly, what is the ability of this patient to manage the secretions? And is there a lot of pooling around the trach tube? So once that is answered for us, it sort of gives us a heads on whether we can proceed with downsizing and then for the decannulation. So yes, it's very important. And I also use a lot of uh, speaking valves because that restores the uh, a subglottic pressure when we give supraglottic uh, swallow and other maneuvers. So that also is very, very helpful in patients with, trich with tracheostomy. So yes, I think it goes hand in hand. Yes. So I think we've had a very, uh, you know, we can collate all this information from different disciplines, which go into managing a patient with tracheostomy. And uh, it is difficult. It's not easy. But when you have input from all these disciplines. And that's where I think we are coming back again and again, that it will not just not be a neurologist or a nurse or a physician. You need these inputs, which are so, so very, um, you know, we can't under uh, overstate this kind of a statement again, that we need inputs. And that's what I think this, this panel is all about, giving you a comprehensive presentation of what can be done. Uh, Preeti, you can uh, go yes, up now, but the surgical approaches have been done yes. already? or Yes. Mom has covered briefly. So uh, then I think the next briefly. one is important, is the next attempt. Yes, yes ma'am. So right now we know what are the do's and don'ts with tracheostomy and we also know the way forward with the intervention uh, with all the inputs from multidiscipline uh, who are present here. So the next question is, what are the indicators for pro uh, progressing to PEG tube from NG tube in cases of long-term dysphagia and stroke and TBI? Uh, Dr. Srimati, if you could uh, share your viewpoints. So depending on the type of stroke and of course the consultant and uh, the stroke physician, they will, uh, neurologist, they will decide on that. But according to the European Society, Parental Enteral Nutrition, if it is more than three weeks, they want to prevent muscle loss and malnutrition. So they are advising a PEG tube in place. But in India, we try to keep it as much as possible, I think, NG, so that it is. But in a traumatic brain injury, yes, after three weeks, many times PEG is uh, done. From the clinical dietitian point of view, yes, the 16 French, yes, we are able to give. But if it is a PEG tube, more uh, food is given, nutrient dense also. But yes, it is possible to give adequate nutrition definitely through the NG. And uh, it is not just the calories and the protein, but also the micronutrients, which are very important to make sure that the patient is getting whichever the age it may be. And also when uh, for the PEG, yes, we do give them more uh, uh, natural foods and also for the NG, natural foods are given. But in an in intensive care, usually scientific feeds are given to prevent aspiration. A lot of time, continuous gravity back feeds are also given. So depending upon the time duration, depending upon the clinical condition of the patient, yes, we do manage both NG and PEG. But the main thing is, as in all neuro cases, the catabolism is very, very fast. And uh, we they really, within a week or so, even if it is a 19, 20-year-old with a TBI, you can see that they lose the muscle mass so fast. They become so malnourished. So it is very important as the S-pen and the 
Aspen guideline says, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, please start early enteral nutrition within 24 to 48 hours, even if it is a very small uh, feeds, trophic feeds that can be given, but ensure that early enteral nutrition should be uh, given the utmost importance so that we don't have any bacterial translocation or we don't want the better tolerance it is. And also, if you see in a neuro patient, constipation is a big uh, issue and uh, we do give fiber in different forms. And uh, we work with the physiotherapist, which is very important because I think uh, this is a great panel where interdisciplinary things. So if the physiotherapist want to come and give physiotherapy for the definitely everyone early mobilization even in a COVID they have said that mobilization is most important so I think every ICU is following that so the proper coordination between the clinical dietitian the physiotherapist the occupational therapist respiratory therapist and of course the most important part of the team is to have a nutrition support protocol and nurses play a very, very important role. So when Dr. Srivastava mentioned that there is a stroke nursing, I really noted it down to know that what are the nutrition things they are doing. Thank you for that info. And I think that's my input. Preeti, can I just come in for before we get yes, started? Ma'am. Because yes, as, ma'am. as a, again, as a, um, a slight spin-off from, from what uh, Dr. Srimati said. Now, what are the situations wherein I'll give you two clinical situations. One is, uh, you know, the, the rice tube is in or the feeding tube is in and they start producing so much of secretions that, you know, the, the, the very fact that you have uh, a feeding tube in, they keep aspirating because there's a lot of pooling of secretions. For some reason, this is reacting. We've seen this happening. And this probably we've seen more uh, in vascular and multi-infarct, you know, kind of dementia, which they go on to that. And I'm sure they may, because I don't treat TBI, maybe it happens there. The second thing is the, the aggressiveness and also being, uh, you know, they are, well, you know, they, they, they do not have that cognitive, uh, they're not silent and they're not quiet. So they tend to pull it off. So with the, with the good arm, you know, how much you try to refrain and you don't want to refrain them. It, it, you know, it's so inhuman to refrain them. So pulling off a, a feeding tube, you can put back the feeding tube. If you pull off a peg, it's a disaster there. There's a huge trauma happening there. So what do you do in such situations? And the second question is, what is your take on IV hyperalimentation? You know, there are the intravenous uh, elementation also, which is given like we classically see in patients with the, the cancers of the GI system. But do you think they have a role when you have problem in this feeding tube and this and that, and at least in the acute or in certain short term stages? So, uh, for the supplemental uh, parental nutrition, if the gut is working, so when I joined a uh, neuro, people were saying, what are you doing there? It is just the gut is working. All they need is to just pour something. It is a no brainer, but they didn't understand the gut and the brain connection and how important nutrition is in a neuro patient. So the main thing is, so the Espen Aspen guidelines very clearly says you cannot give a parental nutrition or even a supplemental parental as long as the gut is working. So they are also telling us to give maybe a post pyloric feeding, but not a parenteral. So only if it is more than four weeks where you can't achieve, then yes, supplemental is given because there have been adverse effects when there is parenteral. So when the gut is working, use it is the term that is given in Aspen and Aspen guidelines. And also we also believe. Adam, just to add yes, regarding uh, doing the pig in Indian in Indian scenario, people don't want to go for pig, but there are three or four indications which we should keep it in mind. One, in anterior strokes, those who require decompressive craniectomies, those patients will require long term care for indication. Second, those who have a PCS stroke, major later medullary symptom of busy heart thrombosis, we should go for a pig. That will ease their solo therapy. In TBIs. Those who have a diffuse axonal injury, grade three, or those who require decompression surgeries should have a pick. That's great. So great takeoff. So Preeti, you can carry on. Sorry. Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, any adding uh, points to this, Dr. Biplav? Yeah, nothing. So just one thing, uh, probably Dr. Abhishek was telling. Uh, so probably the hemi kind of surviving large kidney impact and maybe uh, the left being involved because uh, we have patients who are having the right side involvement. So but in such patients, the outcome is really, I mean, quite good. I mean, in such patients, I mean, like we've seen in spite of disease dysphagia, not required. Maybe uh, you can correct that one. So another thing, I mean, like wonderful discussion is regarding uh, PAG. So as you say, it's so, so much of uh, reluctance in, in the, from uh, uh, patients, attendant and family members, convincing them to go for PAG is like really challenging. So for them is once the, uh, the patient is slightly, you know, get, getting consciousness, so start removing either your uh, rails tube, take out the rails tube, or you don't talk about PAG at all. So uh, the data is quite different, you know. There are, there are published data also, if I'm not wrong, in 2017, there's a publications from the American the AHA, uh, there's a publication, Food Trial was there. So they also, I mean, compared this one, early versus late and uh, old age versus young age uh, going for PAG. So in our practical setup, we go for like, you know, counseling patients like uh, maybe one and one and a half months, especially as, as uh, Dr. Abhishek was also telling like, you know, post secretion TPI patients are uh, worrying uh, quite bad reading or unconscious who you feel that it's required. So one of the things I, I have a question, I mean, like uh, somebody is having, you have done PAG, okay? So maybe like young age or someone, and over the time, the person has gained consciousness relatively better. Would you like to give a try for, you know, for giving uh, oral and then, you know, take out when you take this call? I you know, think how... his internet connection is low. So can I move forward, sir? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, letting us know. And it was a great discussion on how to progress through PEC tube. Our next question is to Dr. Mansi. Supraglottic and Mendelssohn or effortful swallow should help any swallowing problem. What is your comment on this, Dr. Mansi? Uh, so uh, when we talk about intervention of dysphagia, we need to understand the pathophysiology. We know that uh, swallowing is an absolutely integrate um, uh, mechanism which involves the oral preparatory, oral pharyngeal and esophageal phases. So once we know what is causing the dysphagia, we can treat the dysphagia better. So all the three maneuvers that you have mentioned work with patients. One of it improves the hyalaryngeal elevation. The supraglottic swallow is an airway protective maneuver which helps and prevents aspiration from happening. And effortful swallow improves the pharyngeal squeeze. There are many other maneuvers like the Masako or the Shakir's maneuver which help the patients um, uh, improve their swallowing function. And to supplement this, we can also use uh, electrical stimulation along with the tradi traditional therapy approaches to uh, get uh, best outcome for our patients. So yes, they definitely uh, work. And even uh, literature is in support of using these maneuvers on patients with neurogenic dysphagia. Definitely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mansi. Uh, moving on to the next question. Yeah. Ma'am, you have anything to say? No, no, just move on. Okay. Okay, to the next question, uh, I would only ask Dr. Nupur uh, because of lack of time and the next question to Dr. Mansi. Dr. Nupur, how is selecting the right assessment tool important in stroke and TBI for overall rehabilitation? Thanks. So typically, whether it is a stroke or a TBI, we prefer in our center, in Bombay Hospital Voices Swallowing Center, we prefer to do a functional, a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing with sensory testing in all the patients. Um, we don't first do a video fluoroscopy for various reasons. Uh, one is that we uh, are able to check the sensory uh, laryngeal sensations by doing, let's say, checking for the laryngeal adductor reflex, we get a good idea of the pharyngeal dysphagia component. Of course, you can't really say everything about the oral component. But after doing the uh, FEES ST, if we feel there is any need uh, where we're not certain, is there a microaspiration happening or we're not very certain, is there a cricopharyngeal spasm and we want to move ahead with the uh, Botox, we want to confirm that then we would do a modified barium swallow. And uh, 
primarily it's just to reduce the radiation uh, that the patient uh, would be exposed to. And uh, also we are very happy with the information that one does get out of just performing a feast. I think it also helps because we have a good setup and we have all of that in-house. So uh, both the tools are very useful. Uh, most of the publications have shown that they can be equally useful. And there are certain situations where the MBS would score over the feast, especially if you're checking for the uh, oral phase and you want to see what's happening with the tongue, etc. But what we we'll prefer to do for the reasons I mentioned is first the feast, and then if necessary, an MBS, and if necessary, in certain situations, manometry or other tests also. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. There are a set of tests that can be used, depends on what are we looking at and what would be uh, available at our setup. So my next question is to Dr. Mansi. What is the right treatment selection? Why is right treatment selection crucial for dysphagia management? Uh, so I would like to continue with what uh, Nupur ma'am said. Uh, we can use fees and modified bait swallow not only for assessment, but also to check what how effective your plan treatment is. Because we now, uh, clinicians, we believe that we should go in for evidence-based practice. And these tools not only give us an idea about what is happening uh, with the swallowing mechanism, but we can also check uh, the patient with different maneuvers and different techniques. Uh, uh, some pointers that we need to remember is that we need to check the patient's cognitive status, the patient's alertness, cooperativeness, and uh, awareness about his problem. We also need to see the postural uh, difficulties the patient has and then plan uh, rightful uh, and optimal uh, therapy techniques that is required for the patient. Yeah. Preeti, you think we can yes, uh, now go on to the, you know, because a lot of other questions have yes. overlapped. So yes, how about taking this, uh, and we need to wind up by 7.30. Yes. We will yes, also need to take the final comments from Dr. Uh, Nirmal. So uh, yes, do you want to yes, ask this role of augmentive devices or prosthetics? Um, the last question, which yes. or you want Doctor, to ask, because otherwise we have one, I think one question is dependence on feeding on caretakers, but then, well, that, you know, the home-based rehabilitation program and, it all depends upon, and we've had some evidence and some publications yes, on that. Ma'am, Dr. Manigandan is not with us, so probably Dr. Man Mansi can uh, sum it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this uh, augmentative, to augmentative de uh, yes, devices. Yes, augmentative devices, yes. That, are, they, are they available with us, and are they in clinical mm -hmm. use? Are they easily available? Yes. So uh, there's a lot of scope for uh, use of prosthetics and uh, augmentative uh, uh, obturators in uh, the field of dysphagia. Uh, uh, knowing a patient who has a lot of nasal regurgitation, we can always suggest and team up with a prosthodontist and prosthetic team to have a palatal lift or uh, uh, fit, in a, fit in an obturator, which will help the patient reduce his nasal regurgitation. So yes, th this is definitely an area which is, really, really underrated and requires a lot of attention. And I think uh, this is the perfect platform where we can team up with our prosthetic team and uh, um, uh, suggest a suitable um, obturator or palatal if, if required for the patients. Do you, are these, are these uh, um, assistive devices, um, you know, they are, they are affordable across things or Yes, ma'am. So these are custom made by uh, the departments and uh, these are absolutely affordable and have a lot of effectiveness when we uh, uh, be complemented with a swallow therapy. Yes, it is available and it is effective also. Yes. That's a great thing. I think the net is also packing up. So I will actually summarize in just a couple of minutes and then I will hand it over. Abhishek, yeah, please carry on. With even last question for Dorcas, I think. Yes, coming. yes, ma'am. Uh, last one question to Dorcas, ma'am. Uh, the 15th question is, what are the challenges in and solution in achieving the readiness of dysphagia rehabilitation in terms of right posture and pulmonary health for dysphagia rehabilitation in patients with stroke and TBI? Uh, thank you, Preeti. Very apt question. And like I said, um, not being considered a minor role, the posture of the patient, especially with stroke, when one side of the trunk is affected, there is so much of synergy in the mix synergy being presented, uh, protraction of the shoulder, and even the neck droops down. Uh, so in such ca cases, to, just to keep it short, there are three different things that we do in our center here with respect to posture. 
One is what uh, Dr. Srivastava already mentioned about the recumbent posture, 30 to 45 degrees, which allows for, you know, bolus, easy bolus transport and even the lingual motion, it uh, makes it easy for the patient. The second thing that we do here is something called as a chin tuck, which all of us must be aware of, um, works primarily in the initiation of the pharyngeal uh, swallow phase and the um, retraction of the base of the tongue. So what it basically does, one of the things is reduces the distance between the larynx and the hyoid, uh, allowing laryngeal elevation, closes off the airways. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, it is to prevent aspiration. And as physios who are not uh, directly or primary uh, focus is uh, unlike SLPs, uh, our role is more to avoid the secondary complications for dysphagia rather than swallow rehabilitation as such. Uh, so uh, this is one of the very um, safe methods, chin tucks and uh, the recumbent posture. The last thing that you also practice is rotation of the head. This works unilaterally and it allows for, um, you know, it facilitates more efficient bolus transport into the more um, you know, strong and sensate um, pharyngeal side. So these are, in short, these are three things. Uh, chest thing, I think, uh, sir, and uh, I think Dr. Biptop also has already spoken about it. Thank you for the question. Yes. So, Abhishek, you wanted to add something? Ma'am, please, 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 okay. please, 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 you can summarize. So I think, I think uh, uh, from what we have gathered right now, that in the that stroke chain of survival, which is uh, sort of the the uh, the example of which which can also be taken for a TBI because they are pretty similar. And not having a hands-on experience with TBI and uh, definitely more than a hands-on experience with stroke uh, uh, care. Uh, you know, the essence of a stroke unit as such is, is essentially this, that you have a bunch of, uh, you know, people who are cognizant of the stroke complications and they would preempt, prevent and treat early as soon as they, they, they appear on the scene. So it is, it is a, a team. And the team essentially has been designated, I think not today, not uh, 10 years back. It's been there on cards for the last 30 years that it is inherently and integrally of uh, great importance to optimize the stroke outcome. So that's, and it's the most unglamorous part of a stroke uh, treatment, you know, besides our IV and EVT and whatnot. And uh, Biplab, isn't it? It is it's essentially the, the, the aftermath of it. A lot of people do that and manage from the scene. And forget about the stroke unit care, which is actually, and it's been documented to up the chances of a good stroke, a stroke outcome by 40%. And this is this is there. So, and in that, the, the team consists of all of them, all, all of all, all of us out here uh, across the disciplines. So we, we've talked about that, of the essential role that each one of us plays and, and how symbiotic the relationship is here. And... Uh, and more, most importantly is to prevent aspiration and take care of the nutritional aspect and also the spin-offs, which can be extremely, extremely deleterious for an outcome after all that you do. So therefore, I think uh, a good take-homes with this. And I would request Dr. Nirmal, as usual, please give your, your final word. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Padma. Thank you, everybody. It was a wonderful session. I think uh, much needed, uh, not well heard and well understood. And uh, I must thank uh, Preeti to take this forward and all the speakers who are here uh, in the different field of neuro rehabilitation, bringing out a multidisciplinary team in dysphagia Phenomenal. I must congratulate you all. And for those who Thank have so not been able to join today, they can go on to the YouTube channel of Indian Academy of Neurology and can watch this again and again. This will be very interesting. You can also share this with other people. They, if they have missed out, they can go to that. Thank you so much, Padma, for being there as a chair.
Thank you so much, sir. And I'm honored to have you all with me. And uh, it was a great session. Thanks to all the panelists. I would like to uh, thank Dr. Nirmal Surya and Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram, who is IAN President and IAN Secretary. I thank the associations, uh, that is Indian Federation of Neuro Rehabilitation, Indian Speech and Hearing Association, Society for Feeding and Swallowing Disorders, my co-coordinators, um, uh, Professor Manmohan Mandiratta, Dr. Abhishek Srivastava, and Mr. Prasanna. I thank the moderator, uh, chairperson, Dr. Padma Ma'am, panelists, definitely uh, Ms. Sonal Chitnas, participants because who have made it a uh, possible and a successful one, and the digital team for all the back end support. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, and uh, it was a great learning. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti. Thank you for holding this. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.